Hello um, and welcome back to the, the Inspiring Workplace of Summer series. Uh, today we have a real treat for you. Uh, not only am I sitting down, which is a treat for me, uh, for the first time, we're, we're changing up the format. I, I'm going to be trying to do my best Parkinson Letterman uh, impression and, and interview today's guest. Um, nothing like doing it live on camera, I'm told. Um, following the interview, as promised, uh, we have our weekly free concert. Uh, and that's going to be from the sensational Dasha and Dave. We're actually performing for you live all the way from Kuala Lumpur in, in Malaysia. So a very late one for them. And, and we're really we're really grateful for what they're going to be doing, bringing a bit of inspiration and music into our living rooms and offices uh, in about 25 minutes. So to our guest, David Zinger, the man who introduced me to the concept of psychological safety, uh, which I will forever be grateful for. Uh, and and that, that now underpins our mission at Inspiring Workplaces. He's the author of four books, 3,000 plus posts, blog posts on employee engagement, and a whole lot more. Uh, please welcome to the summer series, David. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, good. Matt? How, how, what's 2020 been like for you? And you know how, how, how are you engaged in your own work at the moment? Well, I mean, as you and everybody else knows, it's incredible how something so small could change the world in such a very big way. Um, we've been fairly fortunate in Canada and Manitoba, but uh, you need to keep your humility about you because things can change in a week or two uh, with that. I've worked from home for almost uh, 40 years, so I thought, what the heck? Why are all these people here now? Not in my <laughs> home, but, but in every other home. But mine was a choice. For many people, it, it wasn't a choice. It was a pandemic. I um, turned 65 in September, and I received a pension and old age security back in March. And within an hour, my phone rang and I started getting busy and working. It wasn't my intent not to stop working, but I feel a certain freedom and autonomy in my work that I've always had, but it's just that much stronger. Fantastic. So has, has, have you been under lockdown in Canada then? Because I've, I've also worked from home on off more, more, more than most for a few years now, about five, six years. And it feels a little bit different because it feels like it's not my choice. <laughs> the yeah. choice part of being taken away from me. So I'm finding it a little bit frustrating, I'll be honest. Yeah, we're, we're pretty open. And we're now going to phase four, so you can have crowds of a few hundred people. Our restaurants oh, wow. are, are going and everything. But, but once again, uh, I wouldn't get too cocky as a Canadian thinking, oh, yeah, we're doing okay. Just as you think you've got it, uh, then you've really got it. Yeah, well, and, and people try to humanize a virus, which is, it's just a protein, it's, 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 it's not human, it's not, an, it's not an enemy, it's just, it's just out there. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. But anyway, to, to the topic of, of, of this talk, you know, moving beyond the failure of employee engagement. That's pretty strong stuff. Um, what, how's, it, how's it a failure in your, in your opinion and, and why? Well, I think we actually failed in 1990, right after William Kahn, who was a tennis counselor at a rich kids camp in the West Indies and became fascinated with people's connection with work and wrote the landmark article on, and he called it personal engagement and disengagement. At Gallup in 1996 uh, came up with their Q12 and really started to talk about employee engagement. And I think we, we attached too much of engagement to the role of employee, we got engagement too focused in on the measurement. It seems to me some organizations sp spend about 90% of their budget on measuring and 10% mm. on an intervention. And we need to flip that completely around and it should be 90% on educating people for engagement and 10% on measurement. I'm not uh, against measurement. I think measurement tells us how we're doing. It's, it's really important. We're seeing that during COVID. Uh, but I think education is, is really, really important. So I was actually going to ask later on, you know, did employee engagement and the, and, and the measurement technology that came with it weirdly actually dehumanize the workplace? <laughs> Yeah, I think in some ways, uh, I mean, it, technology is neutral. It's what we do with technology. But, but a lot of it got reduced to numbers and PowerPoint decks and presentations. I mean, imagine this, Matt. You complete a survey about your relationship to work, and you never get your information back. It goes yeah. to senior executive, and 
maybe drips down to you in some small fashion or a manager gets implicated because they have lower numbers than their, their, their peer groups. Who's responsible for engagement? I am. Each, each person themselves is responsible while we're accountable for our impact on everyone else. Um, and and the, the truth is, if you actually feed back that, that insight and information that, that people, you know, that, what, what organizations are garnering, you actually build advocacy through something like the, like the Hawthorne effect, you know, the social, social psychology of actually in, involving people in, in decisions and, and, and direction of travel kind of thing. It actually pays off. It actually builds advocacy within an organization too. Um, but you, you probably know a lot more around the, the Hawthorne effect and social, social psychology than myself. Yeah, well, let's turn a light on engagement, so to speak, and, and let's, reali <laughs> let, let's realize that uh, the person who needs the feedback the most is the person who most directly influences it, and that would be the employee. The executive maybe should be the last to get the information on engagement. It, it, it shouldn't be something that's uh, – uh, disengagement shouldn't be a punishable offense. It should be a trigger for a conversation, and, and, and it might – my measurement of engagement gives me guidance on on what I need to do. Because, you know, unfortunately, many employees think engagement is how organizations suck more work out of people. And, and it, that's just not the way it is, although that's sometimes the way it, it seems to be practiced. When I engage well, I, I do make a contribution to the organization, but I improve my well-being. I enhance my relationships. And but. Particularly right now, when so many people have been furloughed or laid off, when my work becomes finding work, boy, do I ever need to engage with that. And I would have hoped that my organization would have helped me equip with the skills for engaging in my work and that those skills would be transferable to uh, developing my own career. Um, so, so what's the impact of the pandemic on engagement then, do you think? Well, you've just touched on it there with the, with the yeah. furloughing but, and, and lots of jobs, but what, what other impact has this pandemic it's, it's like that old statement, he got on his horse and rode off in all directions at once. I mean, some people in healthcare are, are taxed to the max and experiencing burnout. Uh, some people have been furloughed. Some people are helpless. Some people are just thriving on Zoom and, and the technology and the tools, and they love working from home. They've really uh, learned how to jive on, on work-life integration and uh, those elements. It, it's gone right across the spectrum. But as we were talking before we got uh, on air, Roy, who was the author of God of Small Things, said a pandemic can be a portal. And mm -hmm. so I like to think of it as a possible open door to enhancing the authenticity, the realness, and the relevancy of engagement for people working everywhere. Um, well, I know it's, it's, it's impacted us in different ways within our, our organization. Obviously, we, we've become inspiring workplaces, but... Um, I know my I personally struggle with not being able to get out and meet people and travel yeah. and 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 get the energy of other people. Um, so that's something I'm, I'm personally struggling with. Um, but weirdly, um, and maybe shouldn't be admitting this, we've probably communicated better as a team since <laughs> since yeah. the pandemic um, started, and we've been forced to jump on Zoom or Google Meet or whatever it might be. Um, that's probably uh, had, a, had a good influence on me and, and the way I communicate with, with my colleagues. Um, so, you know, I'm going to take the plus side on, on that side of things. Um, are you able to talk about what other kind of failures and impacts, um, you know, around, around employee engagement? I, I, don't, I don't want this to be a, like a negative conversation, but I think it's good to yeah. understand that we've gone wrong to, to move forward. Well, I guess in some ways I've said it already, but I, I think it bears repeating is, is the relevance, relevancy of engagement for the individual, that it really is a, a tool, a perspective, a psychology uh, to enhance uh, their experience of work. And, and I, we, just, we just have really failed at, at helping uh, employees understand that. And helping even the self-employed. You know, many people who are self-employed have big challenges in engaging. Uh, so the idea that the organization's to blame for low levels of engagement is preposterous. They're accountable. They may influence it. But I know self-employed people who struggle every day to, to work. 
Yeah, and, and I think you just t you touched on it before, and I, I want to come back to it because, and I don't think we can talk about this enough around the high impact of, of, of le and the levels of burnout that people might start to be experiencing, um, especially with the, in areas that have more restrictions. Unlike Canada, <laughs> in England we're still pretty much locked down. Um, yeah, have you got any advice or thoughts upon that and how we can try and mitigate against that a bit more? Well, originally we thought burnout was something in the human services professions, and now we're realizing it's everywhere. A, a recent study uh, in the U.S. indicated that about 70% of professionals are experiencing some level of burnout. Three things in burnout, and often the person who's burning out is the last to know, uh, is emotional exhaustion. Many of us feel that exhaustion and we kind of understand it. Secondly is low self-efficacy, which is a psychological term that you can do what's necessary to produce an outcome, which means I feel my work can make a difference and I, I know how to get to it and do it. And the third one, which is really the, the disconcerting one for me is cynicism. If you are feeling more cynical, if you're pretty exhausted and you don't think what you're doing is making a difference, it may not be just you got a bad attitude. You may be experiencing some of the impacts uh, around burnout. And, and I speak from personal experience. Once in human service, I burnt out. And once in the very field of working in engagement, I burnt out to the, and I was in the Middle East at the time. I said, I will no longer work in this field when what I feel I'm doing is putting lipstick on camels. It's still a camel. Um, yeah. And, and it took me a couple of years to really say, okay, where do I reside here? What do I want to do? Uh, what's going on with that? Should I just pull out uh, along the way? So burnout and uh, employee engagement or burnout and work engagement as the academics use, which I'm really mm. fond of, are really like uh, twins. They, they, they kind of kind of work in conjunction with each other based on, and I won't go much further than this, but based on a balance of demands and resources and how many demands you have uh, and the variety of demands and the resources you have to meet those demands. So what if somebody, you know, they're, they're about to become the last person to know uh, around around burnout and we'll, we'll get to some some comments in a second. Um, how, how, how can they help themselves how can it or how can their, their team help that person what's the best course of action you know i got i got distracted because i saw a comment from uh, yeah. one of the people on discretionary effort and i love that i mean discre all our effort is discretionary we we can decide whether uh we're going to show up whether we're going to work or whatever so the idea that engagement is discretionary is of course it is because everything is discretionary so i need to have you go back and ask the question again matt no, it's fine. Um, and, and thanks, Gregory, because uh, Gregory's one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, Greg, uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks for that comment on discretionary effort. Um, what was the question? I think somebody's about to go through um, be burnt out, is, is approaching that place. They might not know themselves, their team might know. What, what, what's the best course of action for somebody? Is there a singular course of action? Or is, it, is it focused on that individual? But are there, are there anything? Are there tips that you can offer to help with people who are suffering from burnouts who are about to go that way? Well, it's hard when you're just about there um, to be able to hold a conversation to say, you know, you sound more cynical than you used to be and you look more exhausted. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you understand what burnout is. Uh, sometimes giving them a little bit of information. I mean, workplaces that have employee assistance programs, and I was the employee assistance counselor for Seagram for 15 years, uh, managers or fellow employees could refer people and say, hey, you know, maybe it's a good chance to go see David and understand uh, what's going on. Because I think sometimes people think burnout is like you've, you've just spontaneously combusted into a ball of flames, and, and that's not yeah. it. it. It can be a, a slow process. And I also think there's a negative connotation around it, uh, like all these things that you're burnt out and that there's a weakness or something. But it's obviously, if seven in ten people are experiencing it, I think that's what you quoted a second ago, or, or, or might be about to actually suffer burnout, then it's something that we should probably need to address, like many things that have been kept in the dark for too long. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate your, your, your advice and um, your expertise on that. Um, 
You know, a quick aside, some people wear burnout as a badge of courage. Oh, look at how hard I'm working. I'm burning out. Uh, well, and, and you got to understand your contribution is not sustainable if that's uh, what you need to do to get there. Well, yeah, that's full other range of the spectrum, isn't it? Uh, which is equally unhealthy. Uh, and I, I've met a few of those people too. And I've, I've always encouraged those people. That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Go home. And like the, the people that stay at, stay at work just to send the email uh, at a certain time of day, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen as much as it did when I was uh, in my 20s. Um, <laughs> so uh, how, how do we move beyond engagement then? Um, because I, I personally think that one of the reasons we, we've evolved into inspiring workplaces is I think people just obsess on term and terminology rather than actual the core principles you know we want to bring humanity back into the workplace make it psychologically safe and um is so could we just move beyond engagement by just dropping these these different buzzwords or is it is it is it more than that um it, it may happen you know I, I i'm more focused on well, moving beyond employee engagement too i i would sit much better with the term personal engagement or work engagement i i really do like the work of a baker and other academics around work engagement and and what they've uncovered and discovered everything from job crafting to the job demand resource model to reducing a measure of engagement down to three questions that's very valid and and reliable i like research i like evidence-based practice practices and and certainly academia is is offering us lots but we need translators to help the everyday person uh, understand that 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 I, I sometimes say, and I still believe it, there is no way to engagement to engage is the way, to really understand that that's a, a way of working, not just a, a measure or a result at the end. And would it be asking too much to ask you what those three questions have, that they've boiled down to? Uh, yeah, vigor, absorption, and dedication, and each one of them has a question attached to it. The Utrecht Work Engagement Scale, I think, had 19 questions or 17 questions, and then someone said, "Can we make it? Can we make it smaller?" And eventually, a, a team brought it down to to three questions that they believe is a fairly valid and reliable, and certainly a usable measure uh, around engagement. When we look at economics coming up. We're, we're going to be asking so much frugal innovation from people working. Uh, maybe mm. if you're in HR or internal comms, one of the frugalities you can bring is say, hey, I wonder if we can change this big old hunk and employee engagement survey that we got and just ask three questions and make it real time and make it relevant and, and be a little less concerned about all this anonymity and not knowing who said what. Like it, like it. So, vigor. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna take a mental note. Vigor, absorption, and dedication are the three uh, mm. three factors from work engagement. It's very yeah. academic. If you go into Google Scholar or you go into academic research, you'll start to find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of research papers on them. Uh, unfortunately, for the average person, they don't read very well uh, because <laughs> of the, because of the rigor. And, yeah. and the relevancy of it. And they all end with the, the classic refrain from academia, more research is required. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I hated that term, I love it now. The more research that is required is for you to conduct your own research, to, to take a gem or a nugget and try it. Don't just quickly install uh, the, the US3, run a pilot, see, does it make a difference? Yeah, yeah, well, and I, I think that's just a, a nice philosophy to have in life anyway. Um, we're yeah. always conducting more research and finding out more about people around us and ourselves, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, good and bad. <laughs> yeah. um, um, what, so somebody watching this uh, and of taking in what we've, we've been talking about, you know, and they care about people, work and engagement, what would you tell them to do this week? Well, you know, I've I've gone back to read Ellen. I, I love academics. I've gone back to read Ellen Langer's work on mindfulness. Uh, it's not the Eastern perspective. It's not gazing at your belly button or just closing your eyes and going um. It's uh, one of the things that she really advocates is noticing differences. So one small thing you could do is with each person you encounter and with each task you encounter, just take a moment to notice one, two, or three uh, differences. Just notice something that's different than you expected and notice that about yourself. And 
I actually believe there's a strong correlation between mindfulness and engagement at a very personal level. So the more mindful you become in each task, not as a 20 minute meditation period or whatever, although that could be quite engaging, um, I think it can make a difference. So to, to mindfulness then, any, any, any areas that you think work better than others? Anything you'd recommend uh, for somebody to start exploring that, that, that part of themselves? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, wherever you're going to be, if you're there already, why don't you show up for it? Um, so it's it's paying a little bit more uh, focus on, on what you're doing. Dampening down uh, the evaluation, got so much evaluation, myself included with all that. And and much like what Ellen Langer said, is, is start to notice distinctions and differences and the context that things are in and, and, and see what's going on. So it, it really brings you more present. It's not some sort of peaceful ohm, like I'm centered and balanced. You can be totally out of whack and still be a bit more mindful about what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're going to try and bring that to different uh, – we're going to be bringing in, in, uh, in Inspire City, like Inspire New York, Inspire Toronto to, around the world, and we actually want to start with uh, like a, a, small, a short session of mindfulness to get people in the right frame of mind to then, you know, be more inclusive, you know, no, no judgments and share stories and experiences with, with, with one another. Um, I think Greg's actually just posted another comment um so here we go can you see that david oh that's good again so so many of my <laughs> friends many many of my friends are retired and so work engagement to me is not job like many of my friends who are retired are working more than they ever worked during their working life so quote unquote so so once again we've got a bit of a terminology thing but you need to know how to engage in retirement if you don't engage with, there's four factors, if you don't engage with a playfulness, a relationship, creativity, and learning, according to George Valiant, you are not going to have a successful retirement. So you, you, need, you need to sometimes even work at play, so to speak. And, and, and maybe that's being a little too cutesy with terms. But yeah, I, I see work being involved in so many elements of my life. But I, maybe from from you know if I was playing Greg's devil uh, devil's advocate here, um, I, what would that not make the organisations trying to improve the people engagement piece just go? All we need to care, worry, all care about is the experience they have at work and and not worry about the impact in outside of it. Um, they not have to have more concern about the experiences inside and outside of work. Except now with, with Zoom and everybody working from home, home life and everything else zooms into the frame. The cat comes, the child comes, the, the dog barks, uh, the postman rings the doorbell, and, and we're forced, literally forced to realize that, oh, there's more going on in our people's lives than we first imagined. No, yeah, here we go. Greg's responded. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. This is <laughs> new, new format. I feel like a bit choppy. Um, so... Oh, this is not something I've read. I've, I was reading something else saying I've already failed. Um, Greg, <laughs> I'm not sure many managers would reach that level of consciousness. Yeah, you know, hopefully all of them, but uh, we all know that that's not necessarily true. I, I guess one of the things I've seen in the pandemic is there's a bigger emphasis on self-management and self-leadership. So as opposed to casting it out there, and back in the old days we, when we talked about employee engagement, I saw many companies refer to employees as them. we got to realize that them is us. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, that's one of the things I've been honing in as well, that where this is – training and focus on people in positions of so-called leadership, like say emotional intelligence. Why wouldn't we want everybody within the organization to be getting better at having emotional intelligence? Because yeah. that would impact everybody. Yeah. Um, not solely for the for the top 5% or whatever it might be. Um, well, look, uh, there is one more question actually um, that I've, I've heard that something's coming up. In August, you, you're, uh, you're soft launching the virtual lunchroom. Uh, small, engaging, and nourishing conversations about work. What is, what is this virtual lunchroom that you talk it's, of? 
Inspired by Johnny Moore, who runs Unhurried Conversations, Katie Elliott, who runs Little Conversations, what I want to do is move engagement and education into conversation. So uh, the virtual lunchroom will be an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It will be on Zoom. I, I quite like the platform, but it'll be limited to about six or seven people. It's not going to be a course. It's not going to be, oh, David Singer, the engagement expert, will tell us for the next hour something about this and this. It's going to be a conversation. So each lunch, as I hope, will have um, a small theme and people will bring their stories, their questions, their comments, uh, their interactions and, and make it come alive in a way that will never be replicated again. They will not be recorded. If you're not yeah. there, you, you're going to miss it. It's not like, oh, I can come in because each person in there is going to change the very structure. In the, the workplaces I used to work in, and as an employee counselor, I'll say this real quick, I used to sometimes go to a manager's lunchroom, an executive lunchroom, and a, and a union lunchroom all in the same day. And it seemed to me often the truth was talked about in the lunchroom, at yeah. least from each group's perspective. And my belief yeah. is that we can bring people from around the world to share their perspectives on work, engagement, and experience. I love it. And, and it's amazing you're doing that because that's exactly what, we're going to try and be bringing with these city events. It's it's no presentations, every setting f facing inwardly, having conversations and storytelling about their experiences yeah. at work, trying to inspire one another, uh, share what what's gone wrong, what hasn't worked. You know, no judgments, psychologically safe, inclusive places. You know, um, bring it back down to the people, um, which gets me going. If you hadn't noticed, um, I did notice so that. <laughs> um, always a pleasure and thank you for pushing me out of my comfort zone a little bit um, and doing this interview um, it's, uh, I've, I've really really enjoyed it and um, I would love to I'm, I'm going to try and sign up to one of your, your lunchroom, virtual lunchrooms as well um, so thank you very much uh, anything right. else to add before, before we head off? Yeah, I'll send you a special invitation. If anybody else is interested, because I haven't got it up yet, it's if you just email me, david at davidzinger.com. If you're a consultant or you're an expert, just park that when you come into mm -hmm. the lunchroom and just talk from your own experience. If you've got experiences from that background, fine, but don't try and correct people. Don't try and make everything right. Just talk from your perspective and offer from, from what you see. I could not agree more. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much, David. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Um, we're going to let you go and um, bring bring in the band, but I will, I'll see you soon at, at one of your lunchrooms and uh, take care and stay safe. Take care, Matt. Bye-bye.